know, I don't have anything else to teach you. I never took that as you can't learn more from me. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 340. Today, my guest is Mr. Tom Fazio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. And I love the traditional martial arts. So I made it my job. It's my job. It's my life. It's what I love. And the entire goal, everything we do at Whistlekick, is to make your experience as a traditional martial artist that much more empowering, enjoyable, really just get you what you need, whether that's products like the stuff we have at whistlekick.com or over at Amazon, things like this podcast, services, you know, we put our weight into Marshall Journal, marshalljournal.com, great original martial arts content, you know, really it's just what do we think needs to be out there? So we do it. If you want to sign up for the newsletter to find out about the new stuff that we've got going on or maybe discounts, you know, we only... Send out maybe one or two a month. Pretty low key. We never spam you, sell your address or anything silly like that. You can sign up over at the website, Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, check out the show notes, maybe some other episodes. We recently expanded the navigation so it's easier to find episodes based on the style of the practitioner or maybe where they're from. And we'll be adding even more stuff to give you more of a path in to find the episodes that interest you. But let's talk about today's episode. My guest today is Mr. Tom Fazio, and his path through the arts, if you were to write an outline, it almost reads like a classic martial arts film. Now, I'm not going to give away the details because I, I want you to be able to experience them in real time as you're listening to him speak, just as I did. I was struck by the way this man articulated himself, the way he expressed his journey. And it was very clear to me, even from the beginning of our episode, as we talked about the beginning of his martial arts journey, how impactful martial arts was for him and really set a trajectory that I don't think could have gone any other way than the way it has. Let me step out of the way and let's welcome Mr. Tom Fazio to the show. Mr. Fazio, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Mr. Lesniak, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> it's great to have you here. And, and you know, you, you're one of those that we had to, had to do a bit of time zone coordination. Here I am, I'm talking to you a bit earlier than normally we would have someone on. And, and I'm talking to you a bit late in your day because you are on the other side of the world. Indeed. Vietnam. Hoi An, Hoi An, Vietnam. Yeah. And what does the martial arts landscape in Hoi An look like? Well, next to none, I'd have really? to say here. Yeah, this is not, uh, I mean, there are, uh, there are a few kind of traditional martial arts uh, in Vietnam, but, but this city is really kind of largely expat oriented with a, a large floating population. And, uh, you know, the local population here is, yeah, there just isn't much of a martial arts community. You know, there's a few people trying to start some things up, some Thai boxing gyms and, and things like that. But, you know, to put things in perspective, they got their first proper, you know, exercise gym probably about six, six months ago, a year ago. So uh, they're just starting off even on that. <laughs> and what's the population? Uh, it's, you know, I'm not actually sure what the with the standing population is they get a, a massive, I mean, this is considered one of the, I think, you know, over the last six months to a year, I think it's held the 14th spot in, uh, you know, world's best destinations for, you know, small cities or towns or something like that. So, uh, so it's a good size. it gets, it, well, it gets a ton of tourism, but it doesn't have a large permanent population. Um, you know, if I had to guess, it's probably less than, you know, less than a half a million people for sure. Maybe only a couple hundred thousand um, at most for static population, but then it gets a ton of tourism, many the millions for tourists. Wow. And to compare that here in the U.S., try to find a town with 20,000 people that doesn't have a martial arts school and maybe more than <laughs> one and a gym or seven. 
Absolutely. I know it's quite different. Mm. Yeah. What brought you to Vietnam? Right. Well, uh, I've been living in, in China for the last decade plus, off and on at least, um, but about 10 years and needed to get out of there. Um, we, you know, me, me, my girlfriend and I had been, had been working and living there for quite some time. And uh, it just started to weigh on us eventually. And we both built up relatively successful businesses in our own, our own domains. And it was really much more of a lifestyle choice to, to leave Shanghai and uh, go someplace. This wasn't kind of a, uh, you know, go to and, and set up a base decision. It was more of a transitional decision that is wound up lasting a little longer than expected. Um, but we're taking this opportunity and I'm fully focusing uh, at least my own time on getting back to, to basics with my own training and, uh, you know, taking business essentially fully remote. You know, I've been teaching and coaching for the last 10 years in, in China. And so this is kind of my attempt to uh, part from direct coaching and move my business, not online per se, but at least to more remote coaching type of process. Mm. Mm. And of course, as an entrepreneur, I've done a fair amount of research on the lesser expensive places that you can live as you start a business. And Vietnam is quite up there. There's, there's a very strong entrepreneurial community, especially expats from the United States. Have you bumped into folks doing that? Um, yeah, it's it's got a, a fair kind of digital nomad footprint. Um, Hoi An, I would not say, has a strong influence, much more so in the bigger cities. Um, but the work that we're trying to do is not really associated with being in Vietnam. Uh, most of my clients are really spread out around the world, if not back in China still. So sure. um, yeah, so it, it's been good. I mean, we live kind of out in the countryside here. Uh, it's pretty quiet and we get into the city to do grocery shopping or get coffee and what have you. But otherwise it's, it's you know, pretty isolated, I guess. Mm-hmm. All right. Gives us a little bit of context for where you are now, but let's let's roll back in time a little bit. Obviously, we're here to talk about martial arts and how martial arts fits into your life. So let's talk about how martial arts entered your life. Sure. Um, yeah. So, geez, I was probably about 10 years old and uh, it was, you know, kind of your classic, well, back in the day, we would have said more karate kid type of situation. I had a childhood bully. You know? <laughs> I think, I think a lot of us kind of had those experiences when we were young and, uh, you know, there was a guy in my neighborhood and it was an unavoidable situation where kind of every day walking home from the bus drop off, uh, there was a guy who was just kind of a couple years older, much larger and, and just would kind of, uh, pester anybody smaller than himself walking back. And, uh, it wasn't anything too tragic, but it, you know, it, I remember the feelings of, um, I suppose, helplessness, you know, a few times that, that came up and just realizing that, you know, I didn't have the strength or the power to, to, to even manage myself. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot to deal with, you know, at that time, it's your whole world. I mean, it hits you pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So I remember one day getting home and telling my father, uh, you know, I need to learn, we only knew about karate back then, you know, it was that, that era. So I was like, well, you know, I got to learn karate. (laughs) <laughs> to defend myself. So before long, I was in a karate class and, uh, that, that was the beginning of my, my journey that, uh, well, took me through many different martial arts and all around the world, I suppose over time. And, yeah. and did your exchanges with that bully change? Did it ever come to blows? Did it, <clears throat> did the confidence you, know, you gain negate uh, yeah. the need for any of that? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, yes to the last question uh, of sorts. And it was it was uh, one of those weird turn of events where uh, the bullying lasted a while and I started training intensively. And I remember having a, a focus in my instructor um, recognizing that at the time and, and giving me a slightly more aggressive training than some of the other kids and thought I could take it. But um, but it was actually really looking back, it was pretty aggressive training for a 10 year old at the time. Uh, but in one year I'd made good progress and, and was really focused and, you know, still took a little bit of abuse, but he wound up moving away after about a year. 
Um, and I kept going for a while longer, but with that, the pressure started to wane and, you know, I felt a little bit more comfortable and slacked off for maybe a year or two. And then, uh, and then I decided to, you know, take martial arts up more seriously again through another system in school. And, but I remember seeing him a few years later. And at that time I was, you know, at least three or four years older. And, and so was he. And, and it was, uh, I think at a gymnasium and a racquetball court and we just crossed paths and. I don't know if he recognized me, but it was uh, one of those feelings where I, you know, all the, you know, all the ill will that I had for the guy and, and maybe uh, anger and, and what have you, it just kind of melted away. I, I felt, I felt like I understood him in that moment. And uh, I just, you know, it was, it was a lot to kind of let go because I realized at the time, the guy, I think he had a troubled childhood and and probably didn't know really what to do with himself and hadn't matured. And, and, uh, at the time when I, we made eye contact, it was just, I felt like I was looking at somebody that really had lost his center and, and lost his control. And at that point I had gained a lot more confidence in the ability to, to handle myself at least. So, uh, a lot shifted, uh, but it was a nice moment where it didn't need to go to a, a point of physical confrontation. Uh, it was much more about understanding. I think. How old were you then? Yeah, geez. Um, early, you know, early to mid teens, if I had to guess, it was probably around 13, 14 years old or something like that. Wow. You know, what you're describing is, is certainly not something that is uncommon, but certainly uncommon for a young man at that age. You know, he, I don't have to tell you, the majority of the people listening will understand, of course, that you know, you start getting into your, your teens and, and hormones. And here you are, you're seeing your bully and Mm -hmm. you've got a bit more skill and confidence. And your, your response rather than even just to posture to, to express that confidence physically, but rather to just what sounds like a tremendous amount of compassion, a level of compassion that I think very few people ever get to in their adult lives and in your early teens. Yeah. Um, I think you're, yeah, I, I appreciate, I think you're giving me a lot of credit. I, I'm not really sure. You know, it was just, it was one of those moments where, um, you know, things, things kind of come into focus and make sense. And I can't say that it was in any conscious uh, act of, of the will to, to forgive the guy or to move on. It was just kind of released. Uh, it was, you know, a, just kind of a sense of understanding. I mean, I've, I, you know, I've had my fair share of bad decisions and, and, uh, you know, I've done plenty of stupid things, uh, <laughs> in my lifetime as well, but it was just one of those moments where you, you, you kind of understand, I guess. I, yeah. Um, certainly I wish that I could have handled uh, most of my troubles in life with a similar fashion. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But it, but as far as my first experience it definitely, you know, it gave perspective, I think, and one of the things that I think that's difficult and for most people uh that initiate martial arts training and uh, and take it seriously is there's there's certainly a lot of machismo and and ego involved in that in that story, but I think that uh I may, maybe you're right perhaps that it, it gave me insight into the the fact that uh, time, time does a lot of funny things to our, <laughs> our perceptions and our, our values. And, you know, a lot of times we'll get heated and I've had a lot, certainly a lot of situations where we get heated in, in the moment. And, uh, you, you know, I've, I've had plenty of decisions where I've made very rash decisions and stuff that I regret after the fact. And, um, but you know, when you've got that distance and that time to kind of process things and, and see things with a bit less uh, emotion involved, a lot of clarity can arise. And yeah, it was just one of those moments, I guess. So that's what got you into martial arts. What kept you? Ah, another great question. Um, yeah, I, I tend to say that that's for every martial artist, there tends to be two, two big questions and those were kind of it. <laughs> um, yeah. So what, what kept me was, um, you know, after a few years and I, I know you've got a very extensive background yourself, there comes a point where you realize you, the reasons that you got into it are no longer needed. 
I mean, you, it doesn't take long to learn it. If, if you, if you have decent instruction and you're conscientious in your training, it doesn't take long to learn how to fight. Um, now, obviously that, you know, that is context dependent and to varying degrees and, and, uh, has a lot to do with the severity of the situation, but to handle yourself in most, at least schoolyard scuffles, if not, uh, most altercations and situations, you know, a few years of training, four to six years, uh, is more than enough to, to become proficient. Uh, but it's, I don't think it's enough to keep you in the game if you're serious about it. And, um, yeah, so it kept me. Uh, there was a big transition, I, I'd say, in my later high school years and, and early university years. Uh, I studied, you know, I studied philosophy and religion uh, as a major in college, and and there was a real convergence between what I was studying there and my training, and uh, certainly my study of Eastern religions and philosophy. And um, I realized that martial arts had a lot more to do with life, uh, you know, with a capital L than anything else. And it was a phenomenal, um, you know, it was a phenomenal framework from which to view the rest of your experience and the rest of the rest of life. And the better that I got and the more that I studied, I realized I just, the the things that I were practicing weren't, (laughs) you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an isolated external domain. It was actually studying the substance of life itself and, and the tools in martial arts. I mean, I, I think that at its core, martial arts is fundamentally about conflict resolution and, uh, and, and dealing with the relationship between momentary insight and, and the, you know, if, you know, at least in terms of real conflict, the moment between life and death and, and, and understanding the, uh, the fleeting aspects of life. And yeah, I, I would just say that these things converged in a way to where I, the physical training and the philosophical training of martial arts converged with what I was essentially trying to understand, uh, in, in a larger, larger spectrum around philosophy and life and how to do something meaningful with my time. And no matter what I looked at, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't find fault with training. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of us try to find something meaningful to do in life, but we don't often ask the question, what can we stop doing and still, and, and still say that we're doing things that are meaningful. Uh, and martial arts has always fallen into that category where I could, I could conclusively say, if I stop doing this, it's quite likely life will not be as meaningful for me. It's, it's, it creates a great deal of relevance and perspective and confidence and, you know, conditioning and, uh, a lot of the stuff that I think empowers us to live uh, a meaningful life. So I'm ranting a little bit here, but that's kind no, of, please, right. that's, that's kind of the essence of it, I guess, what kept me in it. Mm. Makes sense. And certainly no real surprises there. Your your journey, while unique and your own, at the same time parallels, I think, the majority of martial artists that start for one reason and stay for a different reason. And that different reason tends to be far more broad, far more internal. Yeah. Than yeah. Than the the generally external reasons that people will start. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Now you said you relocated from Shanghai. So I'm going to guess that you are a Chinese martial artist. That's not the right terminology. A Chinese martial arts <laughs> practitioner. There we go. Am I am I right? Right. Well, uh no. Uh <laughs> kind kind of no. Um I mean that's that, that's where things get maybe a little bit more complicated. I'm I'm a proper mutt uh in martial it. arts. Um, my early training, I mean, as I mentioned, I started with karate back in the States, uh, but then I wound up, uh, predominantly with Korean martial arts for at least a decade. And I got, uh, you know, ranked in ITF Taekwondo, Shin Mu Hapkido, uh, Musul Kwan martial arts, which was a kind of a hybrid of a few different Korean martial arts. Um, and so that was my central focus for quite a long time. Uh, I taught it for many years. I competed for many years. And um, yeah, and, and that was, it gave me a phenomenal foundation, I think, an understanding uh, for martial arts in general. And I was very fortunate to train with exceptional, absolutely exceptional world-class uh, martial artists through my earlier years. Um, and after college, you know, I had a talk with my uh, instructor and, and mentor, uh, Master Roberto Rowena at the time, um, to where he kind of 
it was an odd conversation. Uh, I always saw him as, as an absolute inspiration and an extreme mentor. The stuff that he could do in his fifties uh, would blow most 20 year olds away um, in terms of his physicality and performance. And it's always an, an unbelievably inspiring, but he kind of, kind of set me free at that point and said, I don't have anything else to teach you. <laughs> and so I said, oh, okay. And I, you know, I laid it out and I was like, do I need to compete? Do I need to fight more? I mean, do I need to, to, to I, any, you know, whatever you think, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to, to take things farther. And he, he left it at that. And so I said, well, uh, I guess I'm going to go back to the origin of things. And so I, I moved to China and started practicing Shaolin Kung Fu and, uh, and that, that started kind of, a, at least a decade long of, travel and study under different Chinese masters and, and, uh, different systems. So I said, you know, I studied a few different places in China and Thailand and Hong Kong. And, um, and it was, it was challenging to find people that would work with me in the way that I, I wanted to progress. Uh, I had, uh, I felt a pretty substantial foundation and a lot of classical instructors don't want um, they either don't understand that all martial arts have a very similar essence and, you know, move body mechanics and movement mechanics are, you know, we're, we're all human and there's something that makes us all very similar when it comes to those things. But if you, if you look for, you know, Chinese classical instruction, uh, very rarely can they understand that there's a lot of crossover for some of these. And so that was challenging to find a teacher that would not essentially put me in a horse stance for another few years. Um, <laughs> but I was, but I was lucky. I found phenomenal, phenomenal teachers that I was able to study uh, some classical Chinese weapons, the, the chain whips, the meteor hammers, the rope darts. Um, you know, I did that for at least a few years. And then I went back and studied some of the other classical Kung Fu weapons, uh, trained in Thai boxing and a little bit of MMA and Jiu Jitsu and Filipino boxing and Kali and, uh, Tai Chi, Baji. I mean, I could list off a whole bunch of different things. Um, I wouldn't say that any of them were to the core of the arts, but I was fortunate to find exceptional instructors who were willing to take me where I was and, and work with me privately to essentially assimilate their skill uh, without needing to compromise my, my background and my base, which I, I feel very grateful for. Um, so yeah, it's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit complex. I mean, I'd say what I've been teaching for the last at least 10 years now has been very much a hybrid uh, system that doesn't really look like too many of the things that I've trained uh, in their purity, but it draws from a lot of these other systems as a base. Um, yeah. And then tries to find a happy medium between self-defense and, and strong foundational, you know, movement. Uh, yeah. Just movement elements, I suppose. A lot of what you're talking about, you know, if we, we kind of distilled it off, would make a pretty good plot for a martial arts film. You're, you're, you train, and then your instructor says, I have nothing left to teach you, and sends you out into the world, and you go to China, and you, you bounce around, and, and masters don't want to take you on, and you finally find one, and, and, you know, here, from what you're describing, you're kind of in that third act, where you've, you've collected collected your own elements and and now you're you're teaching your own your own style if you will and and the circle repeats itself but i want to go back to your instructor releasing you because that's sure. something that you know it's cliche in the movies but it's absolutely not in the traditional arts at least in my experience mm. it's something that you know, the, the ego and the subject of ego in martial arts is one that is, is, is batted about frequently, especially here. Mm. On show. But that says a lot about your instructor. Ah, no doubt that you were, you were working with. So can you tell us, because most of us are never going to experience that being, being sent off to, to gain new knowledge from someone else. Can you tell us mm. what that was like? Well, uh, it was, uh, it was terrible at the time, at the time. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it was at one of those experiences where you, uh, you know, I felt like I was, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, despite the fact that my instructor is a, he was just a, an absolutely wonderful guy and a, and a, and a, and a, just a monster, uh, you know, on the mats and in the ring. I mean, 
phenomenally, phenomenally gifted, uh, you know, ranked and world champion in kickboxing and, and uh, golden gloves champ and uh, ranked in jujitsu and a master of high, you know, highly ranked uh, master of both ITF and WTF. One, I mean, he, he's, he's trained in so many things and his, his proficiency and skill in all of these things was absolutely extraordinary. Um, and, you know, without making this a long session about, about some of the, the insights and skills that he was able to specifically relay his, uh, it was one of those situations where he was an absolutely gifted mover and, uh, had a phenomenal intuition. And, you know, he was also a, a world, uh, a world, a world recognized uh, salsa dancer. So, you know, we, sometimes he would put on salsa music while we would fight. And he would, he would talk to us about rhythm and timing and, and get us to, uh, essentially, you know, listen and move with certain beats and, um, all these kinds of things just to try to add insight and timing and rhythm to the game. And, um, you know, so his, his depth of knowledge was extraordinary, but he was also not what I would consider. Um, I don't know how to say this delicately. He wasn't what I would consider an intellectual martial artist. Uh, not that he didn't have an incredibly deep understanding of martial arts, uh, but he was in no way academic about his his training or his skill sets, and a lot of the things that he could do um, were street, like they were old school, dirty street. Uh, and his understanding, like uh, you know, I've I've trained with uh, in terms of world class martial artists. I mean, dozens and dozens around the world, guys that I mean are mind blowing in their talent. And he was up there with the one or two guys that when you train with him and you move with him, um, it's frightening sometimes because you feel a power and a capability that you, you almost never feel around other human beings. I mean, it's like a wild animal in some cases. Uh, and you see that glow in his eyes and the power in his movements. And, uh, and it was just one of those things. But, you know, when he, when he said, you know, I don't have anything else to teach you, I never took that as you can't learn more from me. Uh, but what I took that as there's nothing that we can formalize. There's nothing that I have technically that I can give you. I mean, he's the type of guy that if you spend time around him, his, his presence and his movement and his ability to, you know, to deal with just interesting problems that, that crop up in, in, in fighting scenarios and his, his ability to move in ways that he doesn't fully, he, he hasn't been taught but he's learned and he's taken those things on and that stuff is impossible to pass on unless you spend a great deal of time just analyzing and breaking down movement and studying or just spending a lot of time studying the arts. And so I, I really took it much more as, you know, I've taught you, uh, you know, I've taught you as much as I can within these systems. Uh, but you know, that's kind of where it's at. Um, but, uh, you know, that being said, he, he did, he kind of adopted me. Uh, I mean, I was with him for about four years throughout my college years. And we met my freshman year as he was um, associated with the Taekwondo club at the time. And, and he would be coming up for workshops and seminars and through the school uh, that was essentially running that club. Um, and I was, a, you know, I came from another system. I came from Musul Kwan at the time. It, uh, it was ranked at the time as a black belt. And there was one uh, workshop where he came up to me afterwards and he asked me who I was training with and studying with. And he said, look, he was like, I, I you know, I know where you're at. Um, I, I know I can say for a fact that, that who you're training with right now cannot give you what I can give you. And I know it's a tough decision to, to consider changing teachers in schools, but he was like, but you need to consider this. I can take you where your school cannot. Now you could just tell from the technique. Um, and that was an incredibly difficult decision. It took me at least six months to really think through because I felt loyal to my school. And, um, but yeah, it was, he was right. I mean, he was a hundred percent right. But, uh, um, yeah, very few people could, could teach what he could teach. And he was generous with that. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was very fortunate to be able to work with him. Mm. I want to ask for just a, just a little bit more on this subject, then, then we'll move on. Sure. When I asked you initially what it was like to be, to be sent off, to be released, you hmm. s the first word you used was it was terrible. <laughs> okay. So yeah. I, I kind of want to just get in, into a bit of the emotion of that, because here, you know, you've given us more context for your relationship with this man, how much esteem you hold him in, his, his skill, right. and the... 
the challenging decision that you went through to start working with him and how important that was. Right. And then to have to move on. But bring us bring us inside your head, if you will, in that moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, you know, in, in retrospect, it was uh, it was a, it was a tremendous life lesson. But you know, there's that classical Buddhist quote that is kind of uh, <laughs> it's ironic and it's difficult for a lot of people practicing. Uh, I'm not a, a Buddhist or anything, uh, you know, particular by name. But but there's a classical paradox, at least in Buddhism, where they say, you know, if you find a Buddha on the road, kill him. Um, and it's and this is a quote within Buddhism, not, uh, you know, not outside of that. So it's particularly ironic and difficult for some people to, to fully embrace, but, uh, it was that moment. I mean, it was that moment where, um, you know, in, in giving me essentially that, I don't know, I, I could have stayed and trained with him, but I think that to a certain extent, he, he acknowledged that, uh, I, you know, I, it might be better for me to, to explore or learn what I could elsewhere. Um, but it's, it's that moment where you hold somebody in great esteem and, and you come to realize not that he can't give you more, um, but that it's your time to, to make that, you know, to, to become a light for yourself. Um, and it's, it, it's one of those moments that and I think, that, I mean, I'm sure that you can understand this and anybody that has really been committed to a, a craft of any kind for a very long time, there comes a moment where you have to be willing to kill your mentor or kill, you know, kill that vision you have for the good or the great or the perfect, or, um, you know, the light that's been feeding you. It's important sometimes, sometimes that you destroy that so that you can find that in yourself. And, and it really became that kind of transition for me. Um, it was, it was difficult. It was challenging. It was painful, uh, because I let, you know, it left me in the dark for a while. Um, but at the same time, it made me realize that for the next, you know, 10, 15 years that I might find phenomenal, phenomenal, uh, guidance and lights, uh, but they were not mine to keep, uh, you know, they were, they were mine to, to see, to appreciate, to, uh, inculcate or take on. And, um, but, but fundamentally, uh, and I think this is very much the spirit of the martial arts. Uh, if, if you ever need to apply what you're learning, you're alone. I mean, there's a real honesty about that process. And uh, if you ever have to fight, if you're ever in the ring, if you're ever on the street, um, no belt matters, no instructor matters. It's, uh, it's that point where you need to be that, that light for yourself and see with clear eyes and not be clouded or delusional. And, um, yeah, you know, so it, it's just, it's complex in that, in that moment because it was a difficult, uh, realization that I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be going farther with my mentor. Uh, but at the same time, it paved the way for me to make my own. So, sure. yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I get it. I get it. And I, I don't know that everyone out there is going to get it, but I suspect there are a lot of nodding heads right now. <laughs> when you reflect on your time thus far training, I'm sure there are a lot of stories that come up, a lot of things, a lot of anecdotes or funny moments difficult moments that you could tell us. But if I asked you for your favorite story from your time training, what would that be? Whoa. Um, yeah, that is not easy. Um, sorry, not to pause for too long here. It's, no, no, uh, take your time. I mean, I can, I can say, uh, you know, without a doubt that, that the most, uh, intense and, and memorable experiences that I had were with, uh, with Shaolin monks, uh, bar none. And it wasn't just one. I've had, uh, three that were extraordinarily, um, inspiring for me. Uh, one that taught me the, the chain whip and, uh, and, and Qigong, the one that taught me, um, well, I guess further training in, in the chain whip, but also some of the other weapons of traditional Shaolin and foundations of uh, Shaolin. And then, um, and then another one who was probably the rightful heir and abbot of the Shaolin temple, uh, who the training with him was <laughs> much more passive, but he was one of the most inspiring figures that I've ever met. Um, so yeah, I'll give you the option. Do you want kind of an inspiring, bizarre martial arts uh, story or one that uh, was more gritty training oriented because <laughs> they're, 
Um, the latter. The latter. So yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna make me pick. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is one of the, the the stories that I recount a little bit in in my uh, in my book. Um, but when I was uh, at my first uh, training academy uh, for Shaolin. I was in the north of China uh, in uh, Jilin province. We were probably an hour outside of the nearest city. So we were in the countryside in this uh, training center. And this, this was abnormal. I mean, the, the, the proper uh, Shaolin temple was in Henan, but I had found this school and it seemed interesting. And it was, uh, they were proper Shaolin monks who were teaching and training there. And uh, and the whole thing sounded uh, quite legitimate. Um, and, and that was the beginning of me learning a lot about China in terms of uh, nothing is ever 100% legitimate in China. There's, there's quite a lot of, uh, um, yeah, kind of your vision of the old, you know, Chinese sage with the white eyebrows who will teach you the grand lessons. Uh, this still exists, but there is an awful lot of the other as well. It's, I mean, there's not a lot of, of purity in that. And, and it, it's a great place to go to have your ideals crushed, but also still learn something uh, really real about uh, well, life in martial arts. Anyway, so at this academy, there was, um, uh, there was one instructor, Master Su, who was, uh, he, he was probably, you know, in, in, in probably around 30 or early 30s at the time, but his skill was absolutely extraordinary. I was 23, uh, and the other monks that were teaching at the school were also young, between probably 25 and 30 years old. Um, that being said, these guys start at the age of five, and they train six hours a day every day for 15 years. Um, so people that, you know, that train in the West uh, and train as weekend warriors, or even if they're, if they're serious, they train a couple hours a day, know, four or five days a week, they don't understand how little it can compare to that kind of um, it just immersive indoctrination into, the, into a system like that. And the things that these guys can do is mind blowing. Uh, I, I've always considered myself kind of a natural athlete and, and I've, I've been quick to learn uh, most of the things that I've taken on, but a lot of things you cannot replicate uh, that these guys do with anything less than absolute lifetime commitment. So anyway, uh, this guy was, um, was extraordinary. So, uh, you know, there'd be other monks there and we'd, we'd see him from time to time where he was very quiet. He was brought in to teach Qigong, uh, rather than any of the physical forms, but he was so capable that, you know, some of the monks would be messing around or practicing weapons and they'd toss a weapon in him. And occasionally would even be, he wouldn't even be necessarily watching what was going on or paying attention, but you know, the staff would come into, uh, you know, his peripheral vision, he'd grab it. And within three, you know, three to five seconds, he'd be whipping it around like it was, uh, I just with skill that was unfathomable. Um, so, uh, that was the one side of it. The other side of it was, uh, his Qigong training was quite advanced. Uh, it was very advanced. We, we would get up at 5 AM in the morning to get a little bit warmed up and we'd, we'd be practicing, uh, you know, golden belt Qigong in this uh, training hall in freezing conditions. Um, and it was extremely difficult and grueling training on top of, we were training six hours a day. So it was grueling, uh, on top of that, to be up at that hour and standing and holding, uh, you know, golden bell, quote unquote. Um, but he would walk by us in the morning and, uh, from six, seven feet away, you would feel the heat and the energy emanating from his body. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was bitter cold and you would feel the wave of heat coming from him. Uh, you know, and your eyes were closed and you'd be practicing and he'd come up and, uh, you know, he'd test your, your chi and your breathing capacity by literally punching you in the stomach with, your, you know, you, you don't, you're not prepared. You're not thinking about it, but to test whether or not there's enough uh, proper, um, I'm not sure the right way to describe that, but I suppose compression in the lower abdomen. It's not, it's not like you're tense in any way, shape or form, but with that type of training, swells and hardens parts of the body, uh, in, in odd ways. Um, so yeah, so I was able to bond with him and, um, and you know, he, he both, he became my first, uh, chain whip instructor. He wasn't supposed to take on any, any students, uh, outside of the, this. So he, you know, he said he trained me in the, the forest, uh, privately away from the group. And so we would kind of, uh, escape once in a while and go out to the Hills. And, uh, he, you know, he gave me my first chain whip and, 
um, you know, he did it up with the ribbons and all this stuff and, uh, you know, sawed the end of it off, which I remember. And I was a little bit disappointed. I was like, well, you know, why'd you ruin it? And, um, and he, he just, you know, we had, we didn't communicate very well at the time. My Chinese was terrible at the time. Uh, all he did was kind of bring the, uh, the, the, what was left of the end of the rope dart, uh, sorry, the end of the chain whip to his eye insinuating, you know, uh, kind of like a, the Christmas story quote, like you'll, you know, you poke your eye out kid, <laughs> this kind of thing. So he does that. And I was like, uh, okay. Um, and then he said, just, you know, he gave me the two fingers towards his eyes and, you know, he just said, watch me. And, uh, this was my first initiation into Shaolin training and they don't coach you from the ground up. They kind of, they show you something that you just are supposed to pick up, uh, I don't know, through intuition. But he did a few movements, you know, at the time. I mean, I now I, I, I'm very, very familiar with what was going on. But at the time, I, I had no idea what he was doing. Uh, a few movements that were as fast as lightning with his fists. He sprinted across the forest with, you know, four steps, leapt up six feet in the air, flattened out, hovered for, you know, a second or two. And then the chain whip fires out of his hand. Uh, and then he starts spinning it. And I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't track. I couldn't track the whip. I couldn't track even the the ribbon that was attached to it, which, which was supposed to give you a spot. Uh, and then, uh, you know, he was like, he handed it to me and he said, okay, now you do. <laughs> and I was like, um, it was, it was, uh, humbling to say the least. It was humiliating to a certain extent, but, uh, we grew from there. He was patient with me and, and, uh, and I tried my best to, to take it on. And I, I learned with him for a while. Um, but that was my first experience with, the chain whip and it was really getting thrown in the deep end. Um, but, but he was just, it was like watching a wild animal again, move with his, his, his ability was extraordinary. Uh, but to take that to the next level, what really made it profound was that his, his Qigong was on next level stuff. So after a few, um, you know, after a couple of weeks, uh, I was, the training was so severe. It was so severe that, uh, you know, the first week to two weeks, I thought, uh, I thought I was going to have to go to the hospital because I couldn't feel my legs certain days. I could, there were one or two days where I had to miss training because I literally could not get out of bed and walk. And my, my tolerance for pain is not bad. I mean, I, I consider myself relatively okay when it comes to uh, uh, bearing a good portion. And I, I was at the total brink of destruction. Uh, so this was ongoing and, you know, there was a lot that we suffered through, but there was one thing I couldn't kick, which I was, I was starting to accumulate a lot of pain in my lower back. Uh, and it would, it was, would, it would be especially painful after 20, 30 minutes of standing meditation with the arms extended. And, uh, I just couldn't concentrate. I was just like, my, my back was aching and, and my frame was shaking. And, and, and to a certain extent that happens with the training, you have to stick through it, but it was really, uh, it was, I had to talk to him. And so, uh, he, you know, he, he just, he understood and he laid down and he said, well, why don't you lay down for a second? And, um, and so he, you know, touched a few points on my back and he was like, what did you do? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, well, you're injured. You're injured right here. And, and I was like, uh, I don't think so. And he pushed with his finger and I, you know, I howled in pain and I was like, okay, I guess I'm injured. And, uh, I mean, he could feel it without, you know, really, uh, doing anything too in depth. And he said, just, just relax for a minute. And, um, and so he started to move his hands across my back and within a few seconds, they got hot and a few more seconds, they got hotter. And, and after, you know, about 30 seconds to a minute, it felt like there were irons on my back and there was no physical contact. There were, there was, you know, there was space between his palms and my back. I can tell that clearly. Uh, but it was absolute burning, uh, and just fire coming from his hands. Um, and then he said, you know, get some good rest tonight. You'll be fine tomorrow. And so I woke up the next morning and I was pain-free, completely pain-free all, all through my back. Um, so yeah, I, this guy was, uh, he was, he was extraordinary. I mean, his demonstration, everybody, you know, including myself, but all the teachers too, everybody that came to this school had to do a demonstration on day one of their skill to put things in perspective. He, uh, he just went and picked up two bricks from the field. Uh, and he set them on the, you know, the, the, the edge of a table and we've all, I mean, most people that have been in martial arts have done some brick breaking and, and certainly done uh, supported brick breaking, but he set these bricks on the edge of the table with no support, and no hand pressing on them. And he literally sliced the edge off them. And the other half of the brick remains on the table, un, undisturbed. Mm. 
uh, and everybody just kind of said, oh, okay, so this is the new guy. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, he was inspiring, inspiring martial artist. That, that, that word sounds like it doesn't do him justice. It might not. Inspiring. It might not. It's inspiring, yeah. I mean, you, you, you lived it. And, you know, when, when, when stories like this come up, stories that might be a bit difficult for listeners to believe, you know, my, my position here, I don't, I mean, I've seen crazy stuff, so I'm pretty open to just about anything. Mm. I've never seen someone handle a brick the way you're explaining it. But to me, the important yeah. part is not so much whether or not it happened. It's that it, you saw it happen. You believe it happened. It's part of you and your story mm. as a martial artist. And that's powerful. Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. mind-blowing stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I tend to be very, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't often um, talk about too many of the stories or experiences I've had. And when I teach, I really focus on practical, pragmatic aspects of training, structural aspects, fighting. Um, uh, but, you know, for me, I've been lucky to see some of these things, but it's difficult to communicate sometimes because there's no way of avoiding it seeming uh, esoteric, mystical, uh, if not you know, completely fabricated. So, you know, if they're martial artists that have been in the game a while, you, you tend to find some open-mindedness around it or mystics might be open-minded, but, um, yeah. Well, let me give you one more real quick. Uh, I mean, this one, please. yeah. So, uh, a, f a couple years ago, um, and this was a pure, f you know, fluke of luck. I happened to have a friend, uh, whose father was, uh, a Chinese, um, what do we call him? Um, politician of sorts, uh, but he had a high position within the Hunan uh, government. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in high martial arts, there is usually a very strong connection between politics and martial arts. It's always been there in, in, in martial arts throughout the history of China, which is a you know, fascinating thing to itself. Um, but because of this, we were able to get my friend and I an invitation to the Shaolin Monastery, uh, which is this secluded mountaintop temple that you have to hike, uh, you have to take, first of all, a cable car. So from the Shaolin Temple region, where there are tens of thousands of students practicing across dozens of fields, and you see those just those fields of, you know, a thousand students at once practicing. I mean, all that stuff is down in the base of the Shaolin Temples. And, and they all train in, in, uh, in, in a very standardized modern system of Shaolin. Uh, but to get to this other temple, you have to, you know, take a cable car for an hour and then you have to hike through the mountains for three hours. Uh, and then you have to have an invitation to get through the doors. So, uh, you don't just go there and get in. We were ext extremely lucky to be able to, uh, to be able to go in and, and meet uh, the man named Shadijian, who, uh, you can find some clips of the guy online, uh, dancing on top of these rooftops atop his cave. He still lives in a cave after 50 years. Uh, 40 years, I think, 45, 50 years, uh, where he is doing his patterns and techniques, uh, essentially dancing on, you know, one meter wide slanted rooftop uh, that looks impressive when you see it on video. But when I was there looking over the edge of, the, uh, of this thing, you're looking down onto mist that is literally uh, 100 plus, if not 200 meters down. Uh, I mean, hundreds of feet we're talking about straight down. And there's nothing that would catch your fall on the other side. Uh, to which, you know, I asked him one time, why do you, why do you train on this? And he just said, because if I make a mistake, I die. So I don't make a mistake. <laughs> he said, when you do your forms, you stand on the ground. He said, but my toes grip the ground. I, I'm, holding the, I'm holding the earth with my toes. You know, it's, it's for dear life most of the time. But, um, <clears throat> but so when we were able to meet uh, Shadijian, the, the story behind this guy is, is such that He's probably the likely uh, true heir of the Shaolin Temple in terms of being the, what should be the abbot in terms of lineage. But uh, there was a lot of politics that went on, and, um, and he wound up essentially reconstructing this old dilapidated monastery as a, as a dying wish of his old master that took him 
uh, you know, 20 to 30 years or something like this of daily construction uh, with all of his other monks carrying concrete blocks up the mountain, constructing the whole thing. And it's, it's absolutely a pristine, beautiful work of art, a uh, beautiful work of art. Uh, there was a renowned Swiss architect that helped weigh in and other Chinese architects. And so, it, I mean, it was, abs- it was absolutely a, a, f- a fantasy land. Uh, but when we met him, um, we, uh, you know, we walked into essentially it was a meditation hall, um, if not a conference hall, but it was a giant, a giant room that probably was something like a basketball court plus, you know, and there were artifacts in here and, and uh, you know, literally uh, crystal Buddhas. I mean, there, there must have been tens if not hundreds of millions worth of artifacts that people have given him that have been uh, of, of gold and of, I mean, pure, like really pure artifacts that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and it, they're just all over the place. And so he's living in this and he's being, you know, served by people that just want to come and, and be with him and support him. Uh, but so we got to talk with him when we first arrived and, you know, uh, which was another humbling experience, but, uh, we talked about meditation for a little bit and then he asked me to do a physical demonstration, <laughs> which is not what you want to hear from, uh, from somebody of his caliber. So, <laughs> you know, there was, there's one technique in Shaolin, which you will see in every, uh, Shaolin or Wushu form, which is essentially stomping the ground. Right. Um, and it's often, often accompanied by a circular hand movement where one, uh, the back of the fist goes into the other palm and, it has a lot of potential translations, but at higher levels, one of the, uh, you know, uh, translations is essentially that this is about energy transference. Um, and that's what you hear. I mean, that's what you hear from a lot of people, right? Uh, so I know the technique, but I know it as somebody who studied it from outside the system and, and kind of picked up the form uh, as needed uh, and demonstrated a few kicks and other techniques as he asked for them. But so I do this technique uh, and I just stomp the ground and I do my technique and he just kind of looks at me and he's like, hmm, okay. And he's like, but um, watch me. And so he does the same thing and he stomped the ground. Uh, and to create a little bit of context, this was an entirely concrete infrastructure. Uh, it was stone for floor. Uh, it was a, a combination of like bedrock, mountain bedrock and stone and marble. I mean, this, this thing, uh, was <laughs> built to withstand, uh, you know, the worst kind of, uh, earthquake probably. It was just an incredible, an incredibly built building. Um, he stomped the ground and the floor shook and you could feel the energy transmission. And it was, you know, like when something eerie happens and the hair on the, you know, your arm stands up and the back of your neck stands up and just fire and energy and just, it was one of the most extraordinary things I have ever seen. And I would not have believed it if I didn't see it, but he just looked at me and he said, he said, um, when you stomp the ground, you kick the ground. He's like, when I stomp, my energy goes everywhere. And you're just like, Okay. <laughs> so we sat down and we talked for a few more minutes about meditation. And then, you know, a few minutes later, somebody comes up who looks totally disheveled and, and nervous and starts pouring tea for us. And Shadujian just starts laughing. Uh, and he says, uh, he sleeps downstairs. Um, but we found out later, uh, there is at least, um, you know, three meters of bedrock and concrete underneath this thing. So he stomped so hard that this guy sleeping beneath the mountain essentially was awoken by this and came up in a panic to try to, you know, keep his master happy. Um, but that was the first 20 minutes of the week. And over the course of the next week, uh, you know, he he just, yeah, just being in his presence, being able to see the way that he moved and, um, you know, his, his Kung Fu looked nothing like what it does at the base of the mountain. Uh, it was absolutely pristine, but like, like you would know after so long that, what you see across all martial arts is that uh, the the arts and forms that are more modernized or that are, are one or two or three steps removed from the true the true practitioner or or uh, you know the master that got his hands dirty, the forms start to take on longer techniques, right? So you start to extend away from your frame a little bit more. Um, you start to to wind up with much more aesthetic looking techniques. You wind up with uh, longer stances, uh, deeper stances. Um, 
full extension of the techniques, you wind up with, in some cases, rigid or locked out techniques. Uh, but his mechanics looked much more like what you would see possibly in a Krav Maga or, or a studio where um, there was a deep understanding of, of the application of these tools. And it looked like a combination between dance and, well, certain applications of Krav Maga, but, but it was very, um, hmm. How to say it was rooted. It was rooted, but elegant and fluid. It looked absolutely nothing like current wushu, modern wushu, and, and other types of martial arts. Um, but the diplomat that we were with has said that you know the government is trying to protect this guy Shidijian because they were they're like it's likely that real Shaolin might die with him. Um, that you know the, the way that everybody practices and teach it now, at least at the base of the mountain and throughout the world, is much more modernized. But uh, there's something very pure about his practice still. Yeah, anyway, that could easily become a, an hour plus uh, recount of a lot of the crazy, crazy things that he uh, was able to do, but I just wanted to share a little bit, I guess. Super cool stuff. Let's bring it back to you. Hmm. What's going on for you? Let's, let's start there. You, you alluded at the beginning of our conversation to coaching others and, and the work that you do online remotely, you know, kind of making a mishmash of some of your words, but let's tell folks what you've got going on and what they might be interested in there. Uh, sure. So, um, yeah, it's a few things. I mean, um, to give you a little bit of context. Uh, so over the last maybe eight years or so, I've put out a few things. One, one of the things that I've, I, I put a lot of time into is my own soft weapon system, which is an amalgam of the, you know, the soft weapons training I did under the Shaolin monks, uh, uh, you know, uh, a kind of, uh, Indonesian sarong, uh, fighting and kind of, uh, Hapkido and, and classical Kung Fu kind of transitions and applications with, with soft weapons and ropes and things. I've been fortunate to have, a, again, a wide range of instruction uh, with soft weapons, but uh, it's led to a very eclectic and, in my mind, comprehensive approach and system. So in terms of my own emphasis in martial arts, that was a big one. I, I've put a lot into that. I have, I have DVDs on the topic that I've put out. And, um, and so the soft weapon stuff is something I, I would consider... Uh, myself, I, I guess, an expert in. Um, I think that I've never seen a more comprehensive system or approach for soft weapons um, than what I deal with. And that's become a very central part of my own training. I still carry it on and I, uh, it's a deep passion for me. I don't get to teach it directly to many people uh, because of the time commitments involved, but I communicate with people all around the world um, that are studying soft weapons and uh, object manipulation and poi and these things that are trying to, to go deeper into that kind of stuff. Um, for the martial arts stuff, I, um, I haven't taught in the last year. In Shanghai, I've had a, a base of students that, I, that were with me off, you know, the longest ones for at least five, six years uh, in Shanghai. But I've been teaching my own system in, in Shanghai for at least a decade. And um, yeah, I don't know if I want to go into too much detail with that, but I would say that it's very much uh, based on sound structural uh, movement, sound biomechanics. It's looking at deeper elements of movements, uh, you know, analysis of, of anatomy in a deep way. And, um, and so it, it, it has a strong structural foundation, but a lot of it is um, stress simulations and, uh, and essentially trying to get the mind to open up in different ways so that we can access different different parts of ourselves, um, under pressure. Uh, and so that was a lot of the stuff in terms of the martial arts and, and, you know, there's a heavy base of Hapkido manipulations and joint locks and throws and chokes and, and, and those things. And, uh, there's influence from both, uh, ITF Taekwondo and Kung Fu roots in terms of my, uh, my striking techniques and some of the foundations that I teach, which are not, not formal in terms of patterns, but I do have some, essential foundations for that I believe is essentially teach force application through key vectors, um, which is a slightly different approach for many. And there are a few formal techniques, but, but a lot of it is essentially understanding body mechanics, biomechanics, um, and, and trying to refine those the kicking techniques heavily influenced by Taekwondo, Hapkido, a little bit of Kung Fu. 
Um, but yeah, so I, I teach, you know, those techniques, the applications are quite varied and take influence from a much wider array of things. But in terms of my, my biggest focal point, uh, so what I would do is as my strongest, um, you know, contribution for the last few years is I, I teach a system of mind body development that I call weightlessness. Um, and if a martial artist were to ask me what weightlessness is, I, I would say that weightlessness is essentially the stuff that makes martial arts work. Um, it looks to the core of, you know, mind and body development in a deep way. It looks, it looks at, it looks at our biomechanics. Uh, it looks at our neurology uh, to a certain extent. It looks at how meditation essentially helps us, uh, you know, rewire, uh, you know, rewire and address the plasticity of our minds and, um, yeah, develop sound structure in the body and essentially how we can integrate the body and mind and perform at our highest, at our highest, uh, capacity. Uh, it's a difficult thing to summarize because it's actually become a very extensive system over the last four years. I've been teaching it to tribes of individuals in Shanghai, generally through tribes of about six, uh, that go through a hundred day process of grueling mind and body training. Um, and it, it covers the full spectrum. Self-defense has always been a component of it, but usually through, uh, to the extent that we can apply stress and, and study ourselves under, under real pressure, uh, which, you know, I think one of the things that martial arts does better than anything else is it allows us to access deeper elements of our neurology and our physiology that are, um, you know, ancient to a certain extent, uh, that don't get triggered under normal types of training scenarios and, and through calm and regular types of training, uh, but that the competitor knows about, that the street fighter knows about, and these things are essential for really understanding ourselves and how, how to address and approach stress. Um, to the non-martial artist, I would say that weightlessness is fundamentally a way of navigating uncertainty in life, and it, it, it deals with how we understand uh, and address stress, uh, how we address change, and essentially, it tries to build a mind and body foundation that allow us to, to face those things at our strongest, but it comes with key insights and tools uh, that allow us to handle, you know, said stress and volatility um, in very specific ways. So there are direct correlations, direct applications. Uh, there's quite a bit of philosophy in terms of... Um, how some of these things relate well beyond training in the gym to uh, life at large. And we often say, you know, weightlessness is not about that hour in the gym. It's about the other 23. Um, so very much how we take that training and make it something that is not exclusive domain specific, but, but how it becomes something that empowers us in the board, you know, in an executive boardroom, how it makes us better uh, partners and parents and athletes and, and across the board. Um, you know, there's that old quote by Robert Persig in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which, which was, uh, you know, well, he's referring to an old classical, uh, you know, Buddhist uh, saying, which is, uh, how do you, you know, the student asks the master, how do you paint the perfect painting? And the master replies, it's easy. You just become perfect and then you paint naturally. Um, and that's really, uh, I think, an approach of martial arts over the long, over the long haul, but it's something that weightlessness tries to do by design in a much faster process, much shorter period of time. Um, and it seems to deliver, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I might, I might, uh, if you don't mind, I might uh, quickly talk about its origin. By all means, please. Yeah. So, you know, after I left, uh, uh, you know, Colorado and, and after I'd kind of gotten the green flag from my old mentor to, to go out and I, I went to China and I studied Kung Fu for a little while and, uh, you know, went to Thailand and I studied Thai boxing for a little while, but there was still something missing. And at that time I was well-versed in uh, many martial arts and, um, had been a teacher specifically of Korean striking arts for a number of years and, uh, and had learned, uh, you know, meditation techniques from, uh, from mindfulness to more classical, uh, meditative techniques from Hapkido uh, you know, focused on, on key or chi energy development, on concentration practices and a wide variety of things. But so you learn these skills in martial arts, but 
you wind up unless you're just you hold you cross your fingers and you hope stuff happens. But the problem that I had at the time was, you know, I'm not I'm not activating my potential. There's something deeply missing here, and um, and I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. And uh, just by a fluke accident, I found this kind of cartoonish book that talked about old. Uh, you know, the term was lightness training. Uh, in, in Chinese, the, the term is called qinggong, um, which literally translates to lightness, but it's what you see like in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, right? Where they're running on the treetops and, uh, and seemingly, uh, you know, floating in odd ways. But uh, this has origins in real Kung Fu training that were, um, had I not met some of the, the monks that I would trained with and, and teachers that I'd met, I would, I would not have even given it an ounce of thought, but having seen what I saw, it made me realize that we were far, very, very far from understanding what we're capable of. Uh, but I, I found this cartoon book that described a couple of these processes of essentially Qing Gong. And, and there was, you know, sprinting for 10 miles and there was leaping 10 feet and these ridiculous short anecdotes with cartoon pictures. And, uh, and so I, I remember reading this and I came across a line uh, that talked about the breathing method. And it was this weird, <laughs> it was this weird moment where 15 years of experience culminated and, and just like a light bulb went off. And I said, Oh my God, this, this, this is real. Um, I, <laughs> I, I've never seen it. I, you know, nobody's put it together for me, but all the stuff that I've been training and studying, this is where it, this is where, it, this is where it comes together. Uh, and I actually kind of recount this story a little bit in the first the first chapter of my book, but it was the the moment that weightlessness became more. Well, it it, it came out of nothing. But I, I moved to the the jungle of Thailand, and I decided to essentially spend my time reconstructing what this cartoon was talking about, but trying as much as I could to do it in an informed and meticulous way, and referring to uh, you know modern physiological texts and and you know qigong texts and trying to understand how these things could could interact and play together and i was training 4 to 6 hours a day and you know waking up with the sun and uh, you know i had dug a hole and and you know put the ankle weights on and put the backpack on and every morning i would leap in and out of the hole and i'd you know i'd practice the breathing techniques in in accordance with the sprinting and the leaping uh, as best I could. Uh, and I would do that in the morning and then I'd, you know, have breakfast and then I'd do a couple more hours of martial arts training and studying. And then in the afternoon I would do more training and, you know, before dinner I'd jump back in the hole and, and would be applying these same techniques and methods. And so I was there for about three months and, um, yeah. And it was, uh, you know, and I went into that experience, uh, being a, a black belt in several martial arts and taking my training very seriously ahead of time. Uh, but it's it's no exaggeration that I I had to totally transformed in that time, but it was in um, it was in very interesting ways, uh, and it was that my body when I wasn't wearing the weight, which became really comfortable, I felt too light. I mean, I literally felt what I could only describe as a, a physical sense of weightlessness or lightness, uh, and my psychology had be had be, become liberated. Uh, I I literally felt fearless, focused, calm, still, um, and powerful. I'd wake up at 5 a.m. and I didn't need to stretch anymore. I could, you know, swing, you know, I could do rising kicks at full speed at, without any preparation. Uh, I could sprint at full speed for literally minutes without losing my breath. I had a standing leap of five feet without any difficulty. It was, a. Uh, you know, an, an extraordinary time. But when I left, uh, when I left the jungle, um, and I went back to, to Chiang Mai and started doing more Thai boxing. What was amazing was after the, the following few months, the feeling of lightness that was in my body didn't go away. And it, that's really when the light bulb went, you know, went off and got solidified. And I realized that this is something that was wholly different from anything that I'd studied, trained, and that it, it, it somehow integrated all these different facets of training, the dynamic stretching, the, the, the uh, meditative arts, the qigong, the mindfulness, uh, you know, the, the strength and resistance training, the deep martial arts training, conditioning, footwork, stance work, technical training, all this stuff, all of it kind of culminated. And um, yeah, and it felt beastly. Uh, but it was an extraordinary experience. I didn't know how to communicate it. I didn't know what happened for many years. And then it took me another decade before 
I committed as a business direction to teach weightlessness and only weightlessness um, because nobody, you know, it, nobody wanted it. Nobody knew what it was. I couldn't really communicate it. And I had to take the risk with business to say, this is it. Uh, and, you know, people are asking for hot dogs uh, and I've got steak and they're not going to like the taste of steak and they may not understand it first, but uh, I need to keep insisting on this. And I had a, you know, a, a substantial business. So I was able to just use that uh, as a leverage point. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it got to a point now where I've been able to teach that exclusively for the last five years. And, uh, um, and that's my, my focal point. And I think that, that weightlessness is very much, it is martial arts, uh, but I, it's, it doesn't have martial techniques. It doesn't, include those things but to a martial artist it's what would make martial arts work and to anybody else it's essentially the spirit and heart of martial arts um expedited you know without the 10 20 years of technical training proficiency it strikes right to the core so uh, that's a little bit of it in principle i guess uh without you know too much of the the technicals sure sure and if people want to find you online social media websites and, and all that where would they find you uh, yeah, so I've got a, a YouTube uh, channel where I am committed to from here on out. Actually, it's been this full year has been kind of consolidating a lot of the uh, the content and, uh, and organizing things so that I can start to push it out in a serious way and make it uh, you know make it my sole focus remotely. Uh, but there's a YouTube channel um, you can find it under my name Tom Fazio or Tom Fazio uh, you know Sash or Rope Dart will. We'll take you right to the channel or the video. Uh, but that will be largely weightlessness centric with a bit of martial arts mixed in. Uh, I've got a, an Instagram channel, weightlessness by Tom Fazio. And, um, yeah. And the website, uh, which will be launching well within the week for sure, but weightlessness.co. And, um, yeah. And for your, uh, for your listeners, uh, I would like to offer, um, you know, I've, I've got a few spaces left, but, if any of them would like to uh, be a part of my, um, what do we call it? I guess a review review team or a launch team. Uh, I plan to come out uh, to re-release or release uh, my book in pursuit of weightlessness again uh, within you know a couple months here, probably uh, around early November. Um, but essentially, it's an offer to uh, have join part of the team and have access uh, to all of my books now and forever for free if they'd like to be a part of that. And all I ask in return is on launch day for them to be willing to write an honest review. Um, so that's something that if anybody you know was interested in, you could either contact me through the site or, or sign up to the newsletter. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to extend that to your, to your guys. So. Awesome. Awesome. And of course, we'll drop all of the links for everything we've talked about today over on our website on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So you get that one-stop shop and more. We'll drop photos and, and some other good stuff over there. Well, this this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate your time and your openness and everything. And I'm going to ask you for just one more thing, the way we sound out every episode. What parting words would you offer up to the folks listening today? Oof, great question. Um, yeah, one phrase. Put if you, if you are a serious, if you consider yourself a serious martial artist, find a way to put skin in the game put skin in the game somehow. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you just, just give you uh, maybe a quick example for myself. Cause it's not always easy to apply that. Uh, I'll try to make this very brief, uh, Jeremy, but, um, you know, with the, with, with the stuff that I developed with the sash work, a lot of people will look at it and they'll say, you know, that stuff won't work. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's too fluffy. Why don't you train with knives, which I do, or just pick up a gun, which I do. I mean, I, I train with those too, but they, it's really important that if you are training uh, in a serious way and you're training anything beyond absolute foundations, that you find a way to make those things real. And one of the things that I've done for years in China is actually um, essentially hire fall guys. And this is not appropriate for everybody, but it, it speaks to the essence of it, which is where I will, I, I will find a way uh, to need to perform certain things. And I've been a long time out of competition. It doesn't, it doesn't motivate me. More, but what does motivate me is 
having to, you know, hiring somebody to essentially help me turn what I'm doing into a, into an aesthetic or a video presentation. Uh, but a lot goes into that uh, because you're nervous about, you know, it not being great. You're nervous about, you know, on the day, are you ready? And, and there's money involved and you've got to be able to show up and all the training and, and all that stuff. So, I mean, I've, I've hired guys and put in hundreds, if not thousands of hours over the last five to 10 years by hiring guys literally to apply my techniques with the sash and martial arts and hapkido and joint locks and pressure points and all the stuff that people tell you, you know, you can't do this because it'll hurt somebody. And, uh, and well, I'm not advocating anybody go out and do crazy things or hurt somebody, but it is absolutely essential that you test what you do. It's essential that you apply what you do and you find a way to make it real. Uh, and that means 100% you need to do it under pressure. So if you're training something that is purely hypothetical or academic, uh, or it's a technique that, uh, especially if it is a technique that has hands-on and requires sensitivity uh, and, and is manipulating another person through force or technique, you have to find a way not just to practice the technique, but to do it under pressure uh, in a way that, that takes you out of your comfort zone, if not stimulates the adrenal response. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, the, the martial arts is wide. So for the philosopher in the martial arts, you may not need this. But if somebody is serious about developing technical skills and being able to apply these things, um, you got to get the hours in, you got to do the drills, but you got to make it real. And there needs to be something uh, and it can be simulated. I do it through, through a video demonstration. There's a lot of pressure that goes into that. Uh, and I try to test myself every time. I do it by hiring people. I don't want to lose the money, but I hire guys to work with me. And I, I apply for one hour straight these techniques over and over and over and over uh, until I'm exhausted. They're exhausted. But um, you know, I've even had times where I've had three guys rotating in and out for an hour and a half where I don't get to rest. Uh, and just to create a sense of pressure and urgency and... Um, and there's probably a million ways to do this, but it's something that, uh, it can't be replicated. Um, you know, and, and it's great to have great teachers, but that's the way of taking the martial arts on for yourself and into yourself and learning what you can truly assimilate and make effective, uh, beyond theory, beyond, beyond, you know, the hypothetical or even the system itself. Um, and that's an important line I think to cross. So what a journey. Quite often I listen to our guests and I take bits and pieces away and find that I'm better because of them. But rarely do I engage in conversation with a martial, martial artist and feel jealous of their journey. And this is one of those times, man, what a powerful, powerful story. And sir, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of this with us. If you want to check out the show notes, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got links to social and websites and other good stuff like that, as well as plenty of other episodes. And of course, sign up for the newsletter while you're there. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are our primary outlets. Of course, we do have some stuff going up on YouTube. New stuff almost every day. You might want to check that out. If you want to write to me directly, the best way is email jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for you now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.